this is session four of the series, Come Out of Babylon Now. To come out of her means that there must be a separation. What are we separating from? The ideologies, paganism, and mindset of the oppressors. To do that, we have to understand the biblical concepts of the authority and anointing of the Most High. This information is extremely important as we prepare for the second exodus that is prophesied in scripture. Many of our people died in the wilderness because they lacked this basic understanding. We can't make the same mistake. It's time to learn the ways of the kingdom. Have you heard preachers say, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm? What does it mean to be anointed? Who are the anointed ones? And why should they not be touched? Let's read this next scripture. Psalm 105, 13 through 15 says, When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. So how many of us thought that this scripture was only talking about pastors? No, in this passage, he is talking about the children of Israel. One of the most important things we have to understand is that in a kingdom, the king separates or sets various things apart and reserves them unto himself. Everything in the kingdom belongs to him, to include the people. Scripture tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. That simply means that he is the owner. So Israel is a nation that he has formed, separated, and anointed to serve in a specific role. As the potter, he made vessels fit for his use, and those vessels function differently. For those of you who know anything about canning, you know that canning jars have to be able to withstand a tremendous amount of heat and not break. If you try using a jar that has not been made for canning, it will break and all of your hard work is going to be in vain. In the same way, some vessels are formed to handle hot liquids while others can only handle cold liquids. Some vessels are formed in a way that allow them to withstand extreme pressures. Again, the king made the vessels fit for his use. So we need to now understand how we are to function as the anointed and appointed vessels of the Most High. But did you know that the Most High also anointed Gentiles to do a specific work? We'll talk about that later in this session. But we can't understand the anointing unless we also understand authority. Authority comes from one source. It comes from the most high, true authority. Yeshua said in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. So let's look at the definition for authority. So if you look up the word authority in Webster's and other dictionaries, you'll see various definitions, but the essence of it is to have the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. When you own something, you have that right to exercise your authority over it. However, none of us can really own anything in this world because everything in it is owned by the creator. We created nothing. We were created. So those in authority give others the right 
to act in a specific way, and they can also delegate authority from one person to another. And then those in authority can also give official permission to do certain things. So keep that definition in mind as we go through this session. So now let's look at the scripture found in Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So the nation of Israel has been created and formed for a specific assignment. No other nation can assume this role. Let's look at this from Amos 3, 1 through 2. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The fact that he says, you only have I chosen among all the families of the earth, tells you that the king has set us apart for his special purpose. A lot of preachers would like for us to believe that this distinction no longer applies. They say all Christians are considered Israel. Is that true? No. Romans 9, Romans 11, and Luke 21, among other passages of scripture, makes it clear. These people who were formed to serve the king in a certain capacity will still fulfill that assignment. This is the purpose for creating them. All right, let's keep going. The scripture that I just read says the anger of the Most High was against the entire family that he brought out of Egypt. Because when he sees us, the house of Israel, he sees us as a family. We're supposed to be one. A good way to explain this is to think of nesting dolls. Some of you may know what they are, but for those who don't, they're a set of wooden dolls of decreasing size that can be placed one inside of the other. Here's a quick video to help you understand the concept for those who may not have seen them. So as I read this passage from John 17, 20 through 23, I want you to picture the nesting dolls that you just saw. All right, this says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is Messiah speaking. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. So now think of us as being one house. When the dolls are all stacked together, they represent the house of Israel. But when each of them are separated from the whole, they're manifested so that they can do the certain tasks that they were formed or created to do. But everything that they do is a representation of the whole. Now think of Adam and Eve. Where was Eve? She was in Adam. She was manifested or revealed so that she could complete her assignment. All of us were still in Adam. Eve was used to help us come into manifestation so that we could do what we were created to do. And the two become one again when they're joined together. So in the eyes of the king, we are one when we are aligned 
properly when we function according to our assigned task. So whatever the assignment is that he formed you to do comes with his authority and anointing to function in that role. The anointing can be considered a cloak. It, it serves as protection. For example, women are under the authority of her husband. He has been anointed to serve as the head of the home. It does not mean that the Most High can't separate a woman unto himself to serve in other ways. If it's a leadership role, those they lead come under that authority, as with Deborah. When they go home, you remove that cloak and you submit to your husband. Why? Because the calling comes from the one who has absolute authority and he determines how the vessels he created will be used. Let's give another example of that. Look at this, the scripture. So the Most High will also use Gentiles to bring about his purposes. As we know, he has used them to execute judgment on his people. And he also uses them to do good for his people. Again, these are vessels, the creator, the owner, formed for a specific purpose. Let's read Isaiah 45 and 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. So the Most High raised up Cyrus to do his bidding. He was authorized, given the authority to do a specific thing. And we see here that the Most High says he anointed him, gave him the power to do it. This comes from Isaiah 45, 3 through 7. It says, God will work through you, Cyrus, that you may know that I, the Lord who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So if you notice here, what's happening is he used Nebuchadnezzar to punish his people. Then he raised up Cyrus to deliver them from their captivity. He said to Cyrus, I'm doing this for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect. <laughs> it's amazing. Let's keep going. This wasn't the only time that the Most High used another king that he was not in covenant with for his purposes. You find the story in 2 Chronicles 35, 20 through 24, where there is a story of Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt. He came to the river Euphrates to fight against uh, Carmish in obedience to the Most High's instructions. But King Josiah of Judah went out to fight against him. And Nico tried to warn him by sending messengers to tell him, look, I don't have anything to do with you. I didn't come to fight against you. He's telling him, I'm following the instructions of God. He commanded me to do this. But Josiah didn't listen. So let's read this and see what happened. So it says, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carmish by the Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, 
What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Refrain from meddling with God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself so that he might fight with him. And he did not heed the words of Nico from the mouth of God. Listen to this. The Most High was telling him, look, stay out of this. I'm using this pagan king, but he didn't listen. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo and the archers shot King Josiah and the king said to his servants, take me away, for I am so severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. So we see that, yes, the Most High can use unbelievers. Let's keep going. But really, it's all about the king having the right to use the vessels he created in any way he chooses. But for believers in Yeshua who are desiring to be used, you can. Messiah talked about making the inside of the cup clean. In him... There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. So go beyond doing just enough and make sacrifices. Make yourself uncomfortable when it comes to the king. Get out of your comfort zone. Spend more time worshiping, spending time in his presence, fasting, praying. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says he is looking to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him so that's not to say that you can just select a position for yourself because you're seeking recognition the king already knows what you can handle let's keep going so the point is that some envy those who may be operating at higher levels not realizing that the person is simply doing the thing they were created to do as a result they received the anointing to carry out that specific thing. What, what they really envy is their glory. They want the attention and the praise that comes with the position. This is what happened to Satan. He was envious of the glory of the Most High. Moses had those who envied him. Messiah had to deal with envy. But the question that we fail to ask is, can I withstand the pressure? that comes with the position. Because the higher you go, the more devils you have to deal with. The pressures that person has been graced to handle could kill you because you were not formed for that role. We have to respect the authority and the anointing that the Most High places on vessels to do a certain work, particularly as we prepare for the second exodus. Oftentimes, those who are used to speak the truth about certain behaviors get attacked because people don't want to hear truth. They don't want to give up the thing that they are already being convicted about. And they won't come out and say that they're angry with Yah, so they attack the messenger. A lot of our prophets died as a result of this. They were treated horribly for speaking what they had been given to say. They became the scapegoat for those who were really rebelling against the Most High. This hasn't changed. There are some who twist scripture to carry out wicked desires of the heart, like those who use scripture to justify slavery. And then there are those who ignore scripture that address behaviors that they don't want to give up. So they hop from one teacher to the other teacher to the next teacher, looking for those who will agree with them. They're reading the same book as the rest of us, but they disagree because the word is speaking against something they're involved in. We have to accept that there are certain restrictions placed on the royal family because of their function. The mandate came from the Most High 
It didn't come from man. So we have to stop hating. The Most High will help us to recognize those he has anointed. He gives us signs to confirm them. So when Joshua replaced Moses, he affirmed Joshua when it was time for Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. The Jordan River parted just like the Red Sea parted for Moses. So it was made clear that Joshua was the one appointed to replace Moses. The anointing is the power attesting to the authority that the representative has been given. And we shouldn't treat it as common. When interacting with the power of the sovereign and his representatives, you, you either bend to that authority or you break <laughs> because you're submitting to the authority of the king, not the person. So again, we should be very careful about rising up against those he has placed in positions to lead. Pray for discernment if you're not sure. And this is really important because sometimes the closer you are to the anointing, the easier it is to treat it as common. When you think about everything that Mo the Most High did through Moses, why was it so easy for 250 men to rise up against him? That's a dangerous position to be in. It can get you killed. Look at this passage from Numbers 12. We'll read 1 through 3. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. So the real reason for their anger wasn't the woman Moses married. They were envious. They resented the level of Moses' anointing and his authority. It had nothing to do with the woman he married. That was only the cover story. So they looked for a reason to come against him. But don't miss the point that they are Moses' brother and sister. This was an inside attack. They treated his anointing and authority as common. Yes, both of them were being used by the Most High, but he chose to use Moses at a higher level. Let's continue reading to see how the Most High responded to them. All right, let's read verses four through eight. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moses? Notice that Moses didn't have to defend himself against them. The Most High heard what they said, and he called all three to appear before him. <laughs> now, he also tells us why he used Moses so mightily. In the previous verses, it said Moses was more humble than all the men on the face of the earth. Here it says, Moses was faithful in all my house. Pay attention, he uses my house. He's a vessel in the house of the king. But then also notice the question he asked, why were you not afraid to speak against him? That should send shivers down your spine. 
If you continue reading the passage, you will see that Miriam was immediately stricken with leprosy. She turned white as snow. So that answers the question about her color. If she was already white, how could she turn white? But if you're reading that, it would appear that Aaron escaped punishment. But did he? We have to keep going because you will see that not long after that, another incident happened. And the very words Aaron spoke against Moses was spoken against him. He reaped what he had sown. Let's keep going. This comes from Numbers 16, 4 through 7. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, which Dathan and Ibaram, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of, of renown, so powerful men. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves? above the assembly of the Lord. <laughs> Basically, they were in leadership, but they didn't really understand or did not want to submit to divine order. All right, I'm going to pick up with eight through 11, verses eight through 11. Then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve them and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? So we see the problem here. Envy. <laughs> Again. They had an assignment. But they wanted to do what Aaron had been appointed to do. Let's keep going with this. And Moses sent to Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Let's see. This tells you their beef was not really with Moses. It was with the Most High. Moses was being used as the scapegoat. Let's see what else happened. So these men resented the authority that Moses had been given and they didn't want to submit to it. So now we'll see how Moses responds. This comes from verses 28 through 34. And Moses said, by this, you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking, all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah. 
with all their goods. So they and all those who all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them. My goodness. And they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. You know, we can clearly see that it was obvious that the Most High was fighting for Moses, and these men should have been able to see that as well. But envy blinded them, and the Most High dealt with them swiftly because he knew that they were really angry at him, not Moses. Moses was the scapegoat. Let's keep going. All right, we'll continue with verses 41 through 44 because it didn't stop there for Moses. It says, On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. So they didn't learn from what they witnessed the day before. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses. So now all of them are against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting. And suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. Let's keep going. Let's see how it all ended. This is coming from verses 46 through 50. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people so he put the incense so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living so the plague was stopped now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. Y'all, this is serious business. We have to learn this lesson. This, the Most High knows that those who come against those he has anointed and appointed are really coming against him. These people saw what Korah had done. They, they knew. They saw them die. And they're going to rise up the very next day. I mean, what is wrong with us? Oh. Okay, let's keep going. The key takeaway from this session is the scripture, touch not my anointed. It refers to every vessel the king has set apart for his use, not just pastors. And we should certainly pray for discernment when others want us to come into agreement with them against other leaders. The same way that the Most High will hold nations accountable that harmed Israel, he will also hold those accountable who rise up against the authority he has placed in Israel. We don't want to be like Korah and nearly 15,000 people who came against Moses. So as we prepare to come out of Babylon, let's pray and continue to seek wisdom and understanding so that we learn how to submit to the order of the house. Shalom, everyone.